Welcome to the Control Engineering webcast, Cybersecurity, What You Need to Know. I'm your moderator, Mark Hosky, and I'm happy to join you today on behalf of Control Engineering and CFE Media and Technology. CFE Media has met the standards and requirements of the Registered Continuing Education Program. Credit earned on completion of the program will be reported to RCEP at rcep.net. A certificate of completion will be issued to each participant. As such, it does not include content that may be deemed or construed to be an approval or an endorsement by RCEP. Today's course will cover cybersecurity as it relates to controls, automation, and instrumentation, especially with more remote connections resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. Cybersecurity design methods and technologies will be explored along with um, training uh, and the need for regular cybersecurity risk assessments and best practices. Learning objectives today are to identify architectures for cybersecurity designs for controls, automation, and instrumentation, learn what should be covered in cybersecurity training, receive tips about cybersecurity best practices, review elements of a cybersecurity risk assessment, review related control engineering cybersecurity research results and advice. To get the best results from the webcast platform, please make note of the following as you participate in today's event. If you're having technical problems, click on the question mark at the top right corner of the screen to bring up a list of system checks to make before escalating to an online technician. If you're experiencing issues with your slides or audio, please refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's headshot. You can control the volume setting of the webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer or by adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you need a technician, type a message into the Ask a Question box and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. Answers to your technical questions will be in the Answered Questions box on the left side of the screen. You can use the Ask a Question box on the left side of the screen to type questions for the speakers anytime during the presentation for the Q&A session at the end. You may ask questions at any time and we'll get to as many as time allows. Questions for today's presenters will be answered verbally during the Q&A session at the end of the webcast. To download the presentation slides, use the event resources area on the left side of your screen. To take the learning unit exam, use the learning unit exam tab option at the top of the screen. The exam will open in a new browser window. You can complete the exam after the webcast. However, the link will break when the webcast signs off. The exam will be posted with the on-demand version of the webcast. The exam is for one RCEP ACEC Certified Professional Development Hour. The webcast is being recorded, including the Q&A session. We'll post the archive on the Control Engineering website in a few days, and we'll send you an email with a link to the archive once it's ready. Method of Delivery and Category. This event is a live educational webcast presented on December 3rd, 2020. The educational category is technical, health, and safety. We'll pause here for a word from our sponsor. Please stay tuned for speaker introductions, presentations, and the question and answer session. After the video, there may be a short pause to compensate for varying internet access speeds. Fortinet surveyed operations leaders in manufacturing, energy, utilities, healthcare, transportation. Findings identified best practices more commonly used by top tier organizations and the impact on those organizations that do not follow similar best practices. Nine out of 10 suffered at least one OT system intrusion this past year, up 19% from 2019. More than half reported intrusions affecting productivity while 37% saw revenue impact. Basic practices for security hygiene are recommended. Taking a proactive approach to security. Work towards centralized visibility and control. And track and report basic cybersecurity metrics. Join the ranks of top tier companies by adopting their OT security practices. Read the 2020 State of Operational Technology and Cybersecurity Report, Fortinet, engineered for safe and secure operations. 
visit us at fortinet.com slash OT. We welcome to the webcast Brad Bonet and Anil uh, Gosine. Brad Bonet is the technical director for Woods Automation and Control Business and has more than 34 years of uh, experience in the industrial processing, process control, control systems, process operations, and management areas, including information technology management. He is a licensed professional engineer, certified automation professional, ISA 99 IEC 62443 cert certified cybersecurity fundamental specialist, and an active member of the ISA 84 standards subcommittees on cybersecurity for SIS, burner management systems, API 556 and 561 committees for control and protection of process heaters and reformers. Anil Gosain is the global program manager for global industrial projects with MG Strategy Plus. and leads the Strategic Efficiency Consortium Security Workgroup, focusing on cybersecurity metrics, threats, vulnerabilities, and mitigation strategies for industrial control system and security intelligence and analysis. He has more than 20 years of industrial construction and management, operations, and engineering experience, including electrical, instrumentation, and automation and process systems, with the past 11 years in the utility industry, engineering and implementing and project managing capital projects. Participation in professional organizations, industry forums and technical committees covers infrastructure development, industrial automation design and implementation, data analytics and cybersecurity processes. I'm the moderator and research presenter for today, Mark T. Hosky, Control Engineering Content Manager. Anil and Brad, please go ahead. Thanks, Mark. Anil? Thank you, Mark. So, th yep, thank you, Mark. Uh, welcome, everyone. So, one of the first things that I'd like to emphasize as we start this presentation is that stakeholders within your organization needs to agree and understand what you're building and basing your cyber framework on. So, whether you might have something in place, it may need to change or be adjusted to what you, you have. So getting upfront stakeholder buy-in from all parts of the organization is key early on. Understand why your organization is doing this. Um, a frequent answer years ago would be because we have to, which is probably not a good answer in terms of how you would deploy or implement something. So understanding that part of it and understanding the consequences from a health, safety, and environmental catastrophe level is what you're trying to avoid from critical um, operation interruption. Know what your organization is trying to comply to, whether or not it's regulatory or an industry best practice. What you're gonna try to do internally, as well as what, mo what might be outsourced and thus the responsibility of your subcontractor firm. You don't wanna build a costly cyber program that will not be supported with the available resources that you have. Know that you ultimately need to make this strategy your own. Customize it, look at the parameters that you have to do, the industry standards, and make sure it's tailored to what your resources and the, industry, the sector you're in. Yeah, I would add uh, the importance of, of, you know, perfection can be the enemy of good enough. And the, the key thing is that whatever model or framework or standard you choose to follow, you definitely need to adapt it to your capability. Uh, because it's very easy to actually over-design and accept all the requirements. Uh, and if they're not a fit for your organization, you actually will not be able to maintain the system. And that actually doesn't provide you protection uh, uh, either. Yep. So on this next slide, this is one viewpoint of looking at the controls that are described within the NIST framework that can quickly show you where you need to address your efforts but also how your vendor security posture is as well. Being able to take an insight from your perspective as an end user all the way through your vendors or subcontractors or consultants is key. 
there needs to be a focus on the controls that your organization and the dependency it has to align your overall improvement and compliance efforts. So yeah, the NIST framework we're starting with, uh, I really like to use the NIST framework as a, uh, as a top level uh, model, especially when we start talking to, to management and to executives, uh, because it's a fairly simple model. Um, there, there are five phases, if you will, of the life cycle of cybersecurity protection. First, the identify uh, domain, which says I've got to identify what I need to protect and what I need to protect it from. Then you enact measures to protect it. Then while you're protecting, you need to monitor to let you know if any of your, your trip wires, back to the old physical security, you know, the, the tin cans on the wire from a, you know, a military field deployment standpoint, uh, are my defenses being tested by someone who is, is trying to get in? And then when those detections are letting you know something is going on, how do you respond and how do you recover? And within that, uh, there are several uh, uh, cores that are um, uh, built out into the, each of those. And the framework starts at, at a high level and then allows you to drill down into detail. And, and the good thing about the framework is there's also a tool. It's, a, it's an Excel spreadsheet that in, in, incorporates all of the supporting other industry standards or reference document details that speak to each of these uh, specific uh, areas of practice uh, within, the, within the core. Um, so, so this is a really good starting point. Um, my personal recommendation is if you're starting to design a program, even before you try and go and jump into a standard like uh, ISA uh, 62443 or jump into implementing uh, NERC SIP, which is a prescriptive requirement, back up and start at this top level and develop your model and your strategy and, and, and evaluate these domains to see where you have touch points and stakeholders in them that, that you need to engage in, in your overall framework. Correct, right? Really, really understanding where you are at that high level framework really will be valuable as you head down further into your program. So one item that, may, that usually does not get the level of attention that it requires is the policies and procedures that will govern your organization. Make sure you start with having or developing an overarching policy that governs how you will detail out these various critical infrastructure protection sections that has buy-in from all stakeholders, as these will touch various parts of your organization. The available frameworks and guidance documents are a great start, but needs to be customized to how you will operate and implement them. Implementation is one of the hardest and time-consuming sections of this process. So spend the time up front in planning and explaining the documents, the implementation process, to all the stakeholders, so when it gets progressed, it's a lot easier to be to manage. Yep, and when I look at this pyramid, I, I kind of see it as upside down because I always see that policy is the top level, uh, and that's a, that's a great place to start because the first questions that you need to answer uh, are typically the why and what, uh, but not necessarily the how. And, and if we start looking at, at a building a policy level first, and most companies actually already have an, an IT security or IT cybersecurity policy in that they can take and then frame in and begin to extend that to their operational uh, technology and, and their physical plant uh, systems. Uh, but, but here we've got several top level policies that, that point out, you know, like your general cybersecurity policy, typically that's an overarching executive or corporate level policy. And it may be a unified policy that addresses both IT and OT domains. And this is when you get started. Uh, you need to engage your, your IT counterparts, find out what the existing policy state, and assess whether a separate policy is needed or if you can reword or add to and, and expand the envelope of that umbrella policy at the very top for general cybersecurity. Then I kind of map back to these uh, elements that within the domains of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover, uh, you have a lot of the, the, the what need to, the what needs to be done uh, that you can build into policies that may either be individual policies or a group policy that ad uh, that addresses the uh, the elements of the NIST framework. Advocate for your framework. Very key and 
very important for the sustainability of your program. It's certainly easier today to get funding for cyber efforts than it was six years ago. But I must emphasize on the need for end user buy-in and funding for understanding from all C-level members, your finance, your operations, everybody really needs to have buy-in early on to understand that. You need to build a business case just as you do for any other major project. This is measured by risk mitigation versus returns on investment. Yeah, and when you begin to speak to some of these, uh, I'll add the NIST framework is an excellent tool, but it doesn't necessarily answer the why questions. It tells a lot of the what. Uh, so one of the things you've got to develop the answers to the why questions based on your own corporate policies, your own corporate risk tolerance, and and budgeting, uh, because you know you do have limited resources with which you're going to be able to uh, to address the the cybersecurity uh, uh, concerns and needs of the organization. And as a tool, I'll add, um, so uh, earlier this year, uh, NIST produced a new special publication, 1800-23, and it's really helpful because it puts a uh, cybersecurity program in the context of asset management. And, and an asset management model is something that a lot of operating companies already have in place that they use to, to manage the, the physical integrity and uh, mechanical integrity of, of existing resources. And, and this document puts it in the context of an asset management model as, hey, you gotta develop an asset inventory. What do I have that needs to be protected and maintained? Uh, what are the risks of that? And then what are the areas that I need to develop and invest in in order to provide that protection? So this is a really good document. It's new out just this year. And, and it's something that kind of fits with some, some um, understood terminology that a lot of operating companies uh, already use. So um, to many executives, that, that primary goal may just be keep my company off the front page news. Uh, <laughs> And, and as we know, cybersecurity and grim misses are well known, and we know that actually even all the way up to the executive level, uh, they can have severe implications. Uh, we know from, from financial losses that we've seen executives uh, at risk for that. But the, but the point is, is the value of, of the company uh, can be greatly impacted uh, by cyber threats, even though not specifically targeted at OT systems. Um, and in many industries, the, the OT and production assets are being specifically targeted by various actor groups. And in those cases, the, uh, the potential risk is far greater than just financial loss or information loss or business compromise. Uh, it actually extends into physical assets to potential harm to the community and environment that have to be considered when we're looking at OT uh, systems. And if you don't protect against, the, against those, you may wind up in a front page story, which is, is not in anybody's uh, goals to achieve. So as we shift the topic to the architecture to deploy cybersecurity, hopefully this is at a point where there's been formal approval of a governance structure, initial funding level. We need to identify the resources that will be allocated. Understand it's always limited resources that are available but on establishing your cyber system program, it has to be and it should be aligned to the documents and the governance and the policies and procedures that your organization approves and that you can maintain. A key critical point is to always ensure that your business strategy aligns to the, to the security principles and that if there is a deviation, that will come back and possibly create risk in your funding levels for future requests. If your strategy changes or your policies changes, go back, revise it, and document it so that there's continuous alignment between what was originally laid out from a strategic level to what you're doing from a cybersecurity deployment level. Be transparent on the capabilities and time allocation that are available in standing up your architecture. Be sure to identify the level of risk that you plan to address in the short term, the medium term, and long term. 
all of which could be different time frames for different organizations depending on the sector you're in. As you progress in, in, in addressing the level of risk reduction, adequately estimate and detail out the effort on resources need to, needed to achieve the goals set. Always look back and ensure that you are staying connected to your business objectives. A lot of executives don't get into the details of what these security expenditures are, and being able to continuously show where you're making an improvement allows those fundings and the buy-ins to stay in. Always connect your business objectives back to what you're doing from an architecture and governance standpoint. And as we previously mentioned, in a business context, it's a risk versus reward model, uh, parallel to a cost-benefit uh, model that, that we put into most business cases. One thing that's really important is that risk does need to be tangible, and that's one of the problems that a lot of executives really struggle with. Uh, they want to get beyond generalized fear and hype. They want to understand in some context what is the real risk to the business or the risk, uh, you know, whether it's a financial risk or a physical risk or environmental or safety risk. So that risk needs to be mapped into a, a familiar framework. And the cost has to be balanced with other business and safety risk costs. So you can provide, you know, uh, prioritize your, your budget and provide all the cybersecurity uh, protection in the world and then reduce your process safety budget and then result in a process safety incident, you haven't gained anything. So risk management is a holistic practice. And especially in the, in the process industries and manufacturing industries where we have operational technology that has physical risk that can be a result of, of cyber events, uh, we need to, to look at it holistically with that overall risk profile and risk management perspective. So with that uh, said, we're going to start. First thing you've got to do if we follow the uh, the risk model, uh, the excuse me, the NIST framework model is is you need to know what you've got to protect. Uh, you've got to define the systems that that you have concerns over, and in that you're going to evaluate risk. So we we've got to know what we need to protect, uh, and then begin to assess what are the potential threats to those assets that you need to protect. And what would be the consequences of their compromise? Um, so uh, we start with, with that risk model. And we have to start with identify. Uh, and, and there are two architectures that can be referenced um, from the NIST framework. One is the, uh, the cybersecurity management system, uh, which is the NCISA 62443-2-1. Um, and then uh, for the technical aspects uh, or the technical architecture, uh, you can look at I ANSI ISA 62443-1-1. So 2-1 is your overall cybersecurity management program. It's like all of the nuts and bolts details that go underneath that you would place underneath the NIST framework. And then 62443-1-1 talks about the technical measures and the technical definitions terms methodologies and techniques to assess the system uh, and, and then implement protections against it. But you gotta start with identify. If you haven't identified what needs to be protected, you can't protect it. Um, and the other thing is that corporate governance or regulations or corporate policy will typically dictate uh, how the cyber risks have to be assessed and managed. Okay, then once we've identified the risks and assessed uh, their potential impact the organization and any required mitigations, which there almost always are, we then begin to uh, uh, develop a protection model. And in that protect uh, uh, step, if you will, stage of the NIST framework, uh, we take those cyber vulnerabilities and threats that we've, we've assessed uh, and we begin to develop protection models. And the one important thing to remember about cyber vulnerabilities and threats, they're, they're manifold. There are many threats and many vulnerabilities, and there is no silver bullet. There's no single technology device or measure you're gonna put in place that's gonna address all the, vulnerabil all the vulnerabilities and, and threats that occur against uh, a, a large or even a moderate uh, network-based um, uh, control system. 
So the cyber protection methodology follows a layer of protection model, very similar to uh, process safety. And, and that protection methodology or model is, is what we call defense in depth. And it assumes that no single level or layer of protection is adequate in itself to defend a complex system. Um, you know, and, and I would refer at that point to ICS CERT has a really good uh, um, recommended practice uh, for defense in depth uh, that I believe we've got a reference to that later it's here on this slide, that a really good ref reference uh, document for talking about defense in depth. Uh, the other point is that those protections really have to be designed in from the bottom up, not added in or added on or just try to protect from the top. Uh, the idea of just bolting on security uh, has just repeatedly proved, proved to be a failing model. And the best way to develop defense in depth is, is from the design up from the bottom up, from the, the very lowest level of switch configuration all the way up to the top corporate level firewall, considerations built in to reduce the attack surface and to um, to secure the edges and monitor unprotected edges to understand what what's trying to, to get into your system um, and and these detailed measures are often taken at, at the very lowest level of systems uh, interestingly enough uh, protections that we've had available to us since the 90s things like the access control list if used effectively and deployed even at the lowest level of systems on computers workstations switches uh, can actually provide a phenomenal layer and even a superior layer or level of protection to uh, a lot of added on components or, or a lot of, of procedure uh, that's been added on later in the process. Yep, and I'd like to emphasize what Brad said, right? Start at the lowest level, at the device level. I've seen it a lot of times where they attack or address the physical and network and then everything below is not remotely addressed so take your time go really from the low the device level and work your way up it really would minimize the time and effort and cost when you get to those network computer and physical layers okay so uh now that i'm going to switch over so up to this point we've, we've talked about what i call the administrative architecture or the managerial architecture which is really your your cybersecurity uh, uh program your cybersecurity protection program uh, uh once again referencing 62443-2-1 uh, now we're going to begin to switch over and talk about some of the technical architecture models and keep in mind when we say architecture there are two different architecture contexts and this is now starting to talk about the technical architecture context, the context of the networks, how they're laid up, uh, how they're laid out, uh, the components within that. And uh, most reference models uh, begin with uh, the Purdue model laying out uh, what I'll call the horizontal levels of segmentation. And you start with level zero, which are the physical devices out there, which may be your transmitters, your sensors, your switches which may actually have intelligence in them nowadays. Quite often they do. Uh, then you move to your level one, which is, is where your generally your, your control intelligence exists and executes and the internet connecting networks that connect that together. Then you move up to level two, which is your supervisory or, or often your HMI land where you have peer to peer between groups of control or controllers. Then up to a higher level and, and this rolls up following the uh, um, uh, ISATR84 model uh, for the and ISA99 model for the Purdue model of, of the stack of the architecture. And uh, uh, this is what I call horizontal segmentation. However, I do want to let everybody know uh, that, that horizontal segmentation is, is not in itself the only segmentation that, that usually is required in order to develop an adequate protection or risk model for your systems. Um, Anil, do you have anything to add to this before I move to the next slide here? No, I think I'll comment on the next one. Okay. So um, this is to, to really point out that, remember, security zones and the definition of the standard and the definition of 62443-1-1 uh, where it talks about the, the idea of zones. Uh, a security zone may be horizontal, like the Purdue network level, or it may be vertical. It may be a functional zone by a system or subsystem. And quite often when I begin to, to analyze a system uh, that has an initial architecture that may have been laid in from a Purdue model only, 
we find subsystems that have unique security risks, as in a threat or vulnerability or consequence, that differ from other sections, other systems within that same network level. So quite often we find that we'll have vertical zones, such as a basic process control system, which may be a DCS or PLC, or PLC zones, or areas of the plant even, that may have different risks uh, than, uh, than other areas. We then have our, our protective systems, like safety instrumented systems, which, uh, you know, my rule is, is that, that a safety system uh, is only as safe as it is secure. We actually have increased performance requirements. Typically, a safety system is expected to be at least one or two orders of magnitude more reliable or a higher degree of integrity than the control system because of the, the things we're asking it to do to provide protection. And equally, that means that the consequence of, of a cyber uh, impact on that system also uh, is much greater. So they have to be considered uh, typically with higher safety, potential safety consequences of the compromise of a safety system. So it's typically in a different zone. We also have critical equipment protection systems, which are very much like the SIS. So these would typically be like large movers or, or um, power generation systems, uh, large pieces of equipment that if they're compromised, there's significant impact. Life safety systems. And another one that I see quite often as a, um, as a zone are third party systems. And sometimes the third party systems may not be uh, an independent zone because of or a separate zone because of the, the consequence, but the fact that they're at higher risk uh, to be a point of, of intrusion uh, or a, a point of compromise uh, to other systems uh, in the same network. Yeah, and I think as you dive into the technical specifications, your SIS versus some of the other zones, those specifications for those systems and the devices are tending to be a little more detailed and different from your traditional operational zones as well. So that probably is worth the attention to really look at your technical specifications that you're doing for those systems and how they're implemented and deployed. So this slide is an example of basically meeting the needs for more information needing to be available on the business or cloud and analytical environment. Certainly, the push to move process data into your business environment, use data diodes, configure your digital sensors, pro properly design and implement any wireless mesh network for smart device systems, ask the vendors you're working with for other installations they may have done with other customers so you can get those end user feedback. Okay. I won't spend long on this, but uh, but the, um, there's something called the conduit, and the conduit are the interconnections between different zones. Conduits are very important. They both quite often become your point of protection or control and monitoring, but also be aware of conduits that may be hidden. Uh, those hidden conduits sometimes are the means that, that uh, most often get compromised. It's the connection you didn't think about between systems that somebody uses to leverage uh, as a pivot point for an attack. So as we progress forward, we talk about our cybersecurity risk assessment. So, you know, our systems are becoming much more and more complex and much more and more connected, which increases the, the exposure of them. And uh, as we implement these systems, we need to also think about um, what's the potential this system is compromised and not just in and of itself, but is it connected to anything else? Back to those conduits that it could become a pivot point to allow a more critical system to be compromised that might have a greater consequence than, than the system I, I have at hand that I'm, I'm looking at immediately. Uh, so risk assessment has to be systemic. Um, and, and we then have to develop a model of how are we going to, to eat this elephant and take this very complex system and break it down and assess the, the risk uh, to my business enterprise from a cybersecurity event uh, that might occur in that system.
So with that, and we talk about uh, OT, one of the things that distinguishes OT from IT is, is OT as an operational technology means that you have a computer-based system that is actively controlling some form of a production process, whether it's a, a flowing process like a hydrocarbon process or a sewer treatment plant or a water treatment plant, or it's a, a robot that's assembling panels going into refrigerators. Um, th there is that digital intelligence is being used to control the actions of a machine or a process that is the foundation of your business. Uh, and in, in many cases, this is the difference. IT, the risk is financial, the risk is business intelligence, the risk is intellectual property. But when we begin to look at OT, those risks move on in, into what I call cyber physical risk, that a compromise of the cyber, cyber system can produce a, a risk that extends beyond business risk. It is ultimately business risk, but beyond just business intelligence, business knowledge, and, and financial risk. It could actually risk life and limb, can risk uh, contamination of the environment, could risk uh, damage to uh, the you know facilities outside of, of the production facility itself. So as a result, we need to take our risk and contextualize it. And when we do an OT risk assessment, we need to consider those physical aspects. So we typically follow process safety risk assessment methodology and look at the potential consequences that are obtained from process safety risk assessments as the potential consequences to a, a cyber compromise in an OT system. The other thing I would add here at uh, the last bullet, some companies include company reputation as a risk domain. So it, it is interesting that sometimes the difference between uh, a process safety risk assessment and a uh, OT cybersecurity risk assessment is that that company reputation may actually have a higher perceived risk than and drive you further up a risk matrix uh, than some of the, the physical risks. So you've got to look at it holistically. You've got to pull the two together when we're looking at, at an OT uh, cybersecurity risk assessment. Okay, so what I've, I've done here is when we do a cybersecurity risk assessment for an OT system, it's a cyber physical risk assessment. And following the industry standards, our uh, our definition of risk is a threat multiplied by vulnerability multiplied by consequence. This is a little bit different than the, the process safety risk assessment. We use the word likelihood. And when we're doing cyber risk, there, there are two components to, the, uh, um, to that, and that's the existence of a threat and the existence of a vulnerability uh, multiplied by consequence. Um, and, and there are things that we need to consider that we have cyber vulnerable layers in our system. And we look at, at this model here that shows that at the very bottom the process control system whose job is to normally control uh, the process uh, when there's not an exceptional demand on it. Uh, then we have other things that we may have uh, like alarms in the process control layer that then the operator takes uh, an extra action upon uh, to, to correct um, uh, if there's an upset. He's warned that it's, it's leaving boundaries and he takes action. And then we last have the safety layers that are automated safety systems that we put in place to uh, prevent uh, exceeding a, a safe design condition and, and um, a disastrous results. Uh, but as we look at these cyber vulnerable layers, we also need to keep in mind that, you know, there are in many facility designs, some of these uh, threats, some of these risks, excuse me, that are protected only by an active system. If we don't have that physical protection layer like relief valves uh, and we're dependent only upon a computer-based system, either the basic process control system or the basic process control system plus a safety system to protect us from a catastrophic event, then it becomes a cyber target. And that becomes a, a cyber risk typically that we have to mitigate. Um, so, so we focus on that. Um, we do need to align our consequences uh, with the process safety risk assessments. So hopefully those are already conducted and documented so we can take those consequence 
uh, assessments already in and use that along now we begin to look at our threat our vulnerability um, and if there's a, a physical layer I may not need to be as concerned I may have an external mitigation that I can take credit for that's not a cyber uh, risk layer uh, against those threats um, the other thing is that likelihood component we really don't have the same type of statistics that we have with a process safety risk assessment and when you conduct a cyber risk assessment you you quite often are driven to a qualitative assessment of that because we just don't have the data uh, matter of fact a lot of us tend to just consider the fact that that the likelihood is a one because of advanced persistent threats and and the large number of vulnerabilities that exist so we begin to, to look at it from a consequence first standpoint and then look at the layers uh, of protection we have in place from a cyber perspective um, the vulnerability existence may be more and more definable but the threat likelihood is really difficult to establish and and that threat can be taken in many cases as a one so as we look or dive further into the topic of risk assessment to the compliance standard that you've determined that you're required to for regulatory compliance or from a best practices voluntary compliance, this slide illustrates the categories that your team would need to go through as you build your documentation out. Do the work up front in understanding, do you have a listing of all your ICS devices, your network equipment, or are you associating those devices with the main equipment like a pump? Know how the processes to your equipment are related from a risk to failure standpoint. Won't dive too much into this, but this really just dives into the seven categories of what you're building a remediation plan to, right? So I'd spend the time on each of those categories, tying in what those assets are and what those threat, con threat characterizations and consequence analysis are, is as well. So regardless of the industry you work in, there are frameworks available on that sector to guide you how to address compliance whether or not it's manufacturing water power. There's a lot of guidance frameworks out there. That's a great start for you to get those in and get started um, with your team. There are also a number of software and hardware tools that you can use to generate information that can help determine compliance and prioritize remediation efforts. You do not want to overwhelm your team with too much components that provide information that you cannot keep up with. Increasingly automated tools are being developed, so don't rush into any solution without researching the marketplace and knowing how it fits into your overall program. I would add one, you know, I, I call it a warning there. There are a lot of tools available and they may call themselves risk assessment tools, but actually a lot of those tools are really just used to develop if they're in, from the cyber side, that's that threat and vulnerability assessment. When you get into risk assessment, remember when you're dealing with OT, you've got to bring that physical component in and make sure it's aligned with your facility process safety risk assessment, or you may wind up with, with risks that are, are impractical, or you wind up spending money that, that's not aligned with your actual risk profile relative to the, the production facility risks itself. Right. So threat intelligence fees have been increasingly in use by end users and OEM. Look at the threat intelligence fees that are available and use them to educate your management and your overall staff. Some of these threat intelligence tools can be tailored to the equipment, hardware, software within your environment, or expanded to give you an industry-wide view of what's occurring within your sector or within your peer. Uh, it's a great tool just to understand what else is going on outside of your organization. Simper vigilance is the word. <laughs> <laughs> As mentioned earlier on a starting point on risk compliance, you need to get an initial snapshot of where you are in meeting the applicable compliance. This does not normally, uh, used to be very costly, you know, from an entry point that I would have um, noticed in the past. But the market and the industry has recognized the need to automate this initial setup 
so that end users can spend greater resources and their time on the remediation and the improvement on that. Focus on shortening the processes and the cost of understanding your compliance posture by leveraging automated platforms and answering the various questions on the control category so that you can spend your time on remediation plans with external or internal resources. This allows you to give and gives you the business case for additional resources to remediate a problem rather than asking for funding to identify a problem. Now, I had in the past... <laughs> Yeah, in the past five years, I think there's been a phenomenal uh, advancement in the technology. A lot of uh, OT uh, threat assessment tools have been uh, made available now. They've been adapted or some even built specifically for OT that allow you to do more than just uh, an imaginary what-if design type analysis that allow you to right. actually uh, go in and, and look at what your asset inventory, build an asset inventory online, and then help you assess the uh, the vulnerabilities of the system and, and its uh, uh, level of risk from that standpoint. Yep, and it's continuously improving and changing, um, changing. So as you work with a vendor, certainly understand what they plan to do in the short and long term. So depending on your environment and organizational governance in cybersecurity, this will govern the risk assessment focus. So these are just a typical set of categories around what you may or may not want to focus your risk assessments on, depending how your structure and your organization is set up. Okay, and here's my, uh, my I guess, punctuation slide. Don't forget the soft assets. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we have a cybersecurity triangle model that we followed for years that, that for cyber protection, we typically have one leg that's technology, we have one leg that's process and procedure, and the third leg, uh, third base leg of that triangle are, are the people. Uh, but an important thing is that I actually propose a teardrop model because the people are the soft underbelly target, and uh, here where the sharks bite the under, underbelly, right? I uh, kind of laugh at that, and, uh, but the point is, is that, that people need to realize that they are targets. Um, and, and actually, in most of the, the events we've had, the effectiveness of social engineering and, and how access is gained is through the people. Uh, you identify administrators, you identify owners of systems, and uh, they're easier to attack than attacking the technology directly. Uh, so, so keep in mind, you cannot forget the soft assets, and that's where training becomes so vital. With that, cybersecurity awareness. Uh, you need to have a, a, a process by which you're training all the users of your system, and especially your administrators and, and your engineers, know that they are targets for social engineering, and be equipped and be wary. Uh, be trained to be vigilant, be informed of threats, and be equipped both technically and organizationally. When I say organizationally, I'm with, with the response process. How do you report uh, that you think somebody is trying to, uh, to fish you or spear fish you, uh, you're getting more frequent spurious requests that are indicative of somebody is targeting you. You need to let your security or cybersecurity organization know that. So you need to have a training program to, to inform and equip uh, operators, engineers, and administrators that they are targets. They're walking around with those big red targets on their shirt that, that a um, – uh, cyber adversary would love to get their credentials and will be working to get, they can assume will be working to get to their credentials. Yeah, and even your, your external third-party vendors, right? I mean, they're working on your environment, so make sure that they're doing a cybersecurity aware, awareness as well. So, okay, I'm beginning to try to wrap this up as we're running out of time. Uh, so some summary guidance. Uh, you know, my recommendation is start with the NIST framework. It's, it's the highest level, most executive, the simplest level, and then drill down. Uh, you know, break it down into those, in, into those basic stages. Um, you, if you're dealing with OT, you do need to align with your facility process with your physical safety risk analysis. 
uh, because you don't want to overassess risk. You want to make sure that, that your risks are assi uh, uh, in balance and in harmony with the physical risks and the, and the process safety risks that have already been identified for your facility. Uh, don't get hung up in the analysis. Use qualitative analysis. Do not get hung up on the quantitative probabilities. Uh, people who've been doing HAZOPs and process safety assessments love to get into the math. Safety systems people love to do SIL calcs. But when we start talking cyber, we just don't have the same uh, valid statistical information to be able to do that level of, of calculation. So we do wind up having to use uh, qualitative values um, in, in the assessment of our risk, not, not so much in the uh, consequence, but, it, but in, the, in that likelihood uh, um, box. Start with a high-level analysis first. Use progressive elaboration. The standards call for two different risk assessments, a high level and then a detailed. Follow that process. Look at the system at a high level first and say, what systems are present and which ones have the greatest risk? Those are the ones I need to focus on protecting the most and then develop that first and then move down into the details of how you're going to protect those systems. And then awareness. Educate your population, educate your users, educate your technicians, your engineers. Let them know about the risk that is being posed to them as uh, administrators and also the risk that they um, pose to the system, you know, by things like use of portable media or even plugging their phone into charge uh, can, can result in, in dire consequences uh, if, if they're not aware of the potential of harm from their actions. So you need to have a training program, uh, and there are multiple programs available. Uh, and I think at this point, we're going to turn it over uh, to Mark to let him talk about some research results, uh, results and also possibly a little bit more about some training. Thank you so much. Um, Control Engineering conducted cybersecurity research among subscribers, collecting data in an online survey February 7th through March 5th, 2020. Five highest risk factors survey respondents identified were the age of existing assets at 67%, lack of training or enforcement related to technologies at 55%, lack of uh, appropriate technologies at 51%, lack of training or enforcement related to policies at 49%, and lack of policies period at 45%. Significantly, there was a four-year sh four shift in perception of risk. Uh, survey respondents to a similar 2016 survey found that age of existing assets, the top concern this year, was third at 46% in 2016. So uh, I believe that the uh, COVID-19 pandemic with more remote operations and other changes to uh, lower workplace risk seems likely to intensify the need for asset uh, modernization. Uh, next, looking at the 2020 results, uh, respondents said the most concerning threat to control systems is malware from a random source with no specific connection to the company or industry. Among uh, concerns are attacks to the company uh, using an unknown network device vulnerability, attack to the company as part of a larger infrastructure disruption, and theft of intellectual property. The least concerning threat uh, was an inside unintentional threat. Those who uh, took the survey were also asked to provide advice to peers based on their knowledge and experiences. Uh, a few of my favorites uh, listed here are covering awareness of uh, deficiencies, uh, audits, inclusion of cybersecurity at project inception, overlap of ITOT and Industrial Internet of Things, security patch updates, timely action, and persistent education of all involved. Finally, additional findings and advice from this research and other cybersecurity coverage can be found at the links provided. And of course, following best practices for web pages, these embedded links to start with HTTPS. Now we have a few minutes for question and answers. The audience listening live can type in questions for today's presenter in the Ask a Question box on the screen. We'll get to as many questions as we can. Within a few days, the presentation will be available for on-demand viewing along with a link to the quiz 
for potential PDH credits. We'll post the archive on the Control Engineering website and send an email with the message link connecting directly to it and related resources after it's ready. And now on to our questions. Are there differences in wired versus wireless cybersecurity best practices? So I'll uh, answer that one. So edge protection and defense in depth are still your principal protection models. Uh, however, there are additional considerations in wireless since that edge is, is considered to be more exposed and it definitely has lesser degrees of physical security layers of protection available. Uh, I mean, in a wired uh, infrastructure, you typically have doors and cabinets and ways to keep people from connecting to the system. But wireless, you, you are exposed and that boundary is extended beyond uh, a point of control in most cases. So the selection of technologies that, you know, that employ inherent device authorizations, uh, you selecting a, a wireless architecture that includes things like uh, ACL use or encryption or device authentication is, is really important uh, when you look at a wireless architecture. Um, also follow the principles of reducing the attack surface or windows of opportunity by, you know, don't use open and commonly exploited wireless technologies. I'll, I'll say it, Bluetooth, just don't use Bluetooth or wireless keyboards, mice, Bluetooth printers. These things are so easily exploited and, and pivoted for data, key capture, or keyboard hijacking, and, and all kinds of things. Very convenient mean, means to, to connect to a system uh, uh, and provide input and output or data extraction, grab passwords. Uh, even things like software configurable digital radio systems that are quite often used for SCADA networks are very easily exploited. And by the way, out of the box, they're not secure. <laughs> you know, they may be secureable, but you need to take attention, pay attention in the configuration and the deployment of those to make sure that you have put defense in depth in place and configured it in a manner in which it, it will limit communication, uh, limit traffic, and, and allow you to manage that device and not just have it sit there wait, waiting for people to connect to or listen to. Great, thanks, Brad. Anil, you take the next question. Uh, what are your recommended uh, best sources of cybersecurity information? So, a lot of us don't have the time to search the many available online or published papers or magazines. So, there are very focused magazines or technical work groups that have aggregated a lot of the cyber news or threat feeds that may be specific to your environment that I've mentioned earlier in the presentation. So being members or joining a lot of these work groups or technical organizations certainly can be a good focus point for aggregated cybersecurity information. Great, thanks. Time for one more question. And if people wanna keep typing questions in, we'll get to them offline. So thank you for the questions and uh, one more. Uh, how do you sell the cybersecurity investment to executive stakeholders to achieve the buy-in that you need? So that one, okay, I'll start with that. But overall solutions are, or have been at least, been provided by combining a number of vendors and consultants putting it together for the end user. Greater and greater pushes from pushback from the end users have allowed holistic solutions to be provided by teams, right? So vendors working together and then providing an integrated solution from your device level all the way through to your security management solution to the end users becoming more and more frequent, not as frequent as it probably needs. I think that will continue to, to grow. But being able to tell, the, tell an end user, look, we have one solution, that has multiple components that we have responsibility on is becoming probably the best way to get that stakeholder buying so that they know it will work in an integrated manner. And so my answer on that would be uh, how to sell the cybersecurity investment is, is, is quantify that risk. Uh, follow your, your existing risk processes and, and do the risk assessments and present and show them the risk and how, uh, how you know, a, cyber compromise of an OT system could lead to one of these same order of magnitude events that, that have been considered in other um, uh, types of safety risk assessments. Uh, the other thing I would add is uh, ANSI ISA 62443-2-4, 
is, it was published in 2018, Security Program Requirements for ICS Service Provider. It's a really good framework document. It is a framework. It can be put into a, an Excel spreadsheet. It can be used to help develop an agreed plan between a uh, an ICSS provider and an end-user customer to say what uh, types of, of cyber protection are going to be designed into a system. Great. Thanks again to our presenters, Brad Bonnet from Wood and Anil Gosing from MG Strategy Plus. Thanks again to our sponsor, Fortinet. And now that we're just about done, we want your feedback. A short survey will pop up on the screen as soon as the webcast event ends. Please take a moment to complete it. We use this information to improve our webcast. Finally, on behalf of Control Engineering and CFE Media and Technology, thanks for attending. This concludes our webcast. Thank you and goodbye.